Okay. Hello, folks. My name is Dwayne. I'm the science fiction fantasy and graphic novel buyer at the University Bookstore. In my spare time, I play in children's books. And we're really excited tonight to be hosting Eliza Bonan. I said it wrong, I know. I'm sorry, I mingled your name. But her book, Dauntless, just, okay, this thing, never did it right, just came out. And we're going to have here tonight her in conversation with Aidan Thomas, whose books include Cemetery Boys and Lost and Never Would. And Eliza has uh, several degrees, has moved around the world. I don't know how much more I want to say about you. I'd rather we save time for the talk. So we'll all this. Go away and show up at the end, and you guys take it away. Sounds good. Um, so, hello. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're so excited to have you here. Elisa, congrats on your book coming out, your debut. Dauntless, you. how does it feel? Are you excited? Um, I'm so excited. It. Um, this whole week, though, I feel like it's been very dreamlike because it's... Yeah. You know, I'm, I live in Germany, for those of you who don't know. And so for me, it's like every day I know the book is out, but I can't really see it on shelves. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's out in the world. But um, it, it also like weirdly feels like an ordinary day. So it's fine. Yeah, totally. Yeah. As, as someone whose debut came out during a pandemic and I couldn't go anywhere or see anyone, I totally understand how it feels like um, your whole book career is just theoretical it exists mostly on the internet because you don't really see it in person <laughs> so i understand that completely um so it's to incredible again, um i've started seeing people send me pictures of receiving the book and my favorite. Like, yeah it exists yeah it's out there and we're all so yeah. excited it was really cool um yesterday going through my Twitter and seeing how many people were excited and sharing and boosting Dauntless. That was, I was, it was so cool. Um, and I felt like very proud and I was just like, yeah, look at us, it's all happening. Uh, so just as a reminder, uh, if you guys have any questions for us at the last 15 or so minutes, we're gonna save for Q and A. So please drop them into the Q and A specific box down below and we will um, get to those a little bit later. Uh, but Elisa, to start us out, can you share what, with us what Dauntless is about for folks who don't know yet? Sure, so for folks who don't know, Dauntless um, is a sapphic YA fantasy set in a Filipino-inspired world. So rather than, um, basically what that means is it's not based in Philippine mythology, but like rather than basing a, making a fantasy world based in medieval Europe, which was the norm for so long, um, I decided to start with the Philippines and with things I was familiar with and build out from there. And it tells the story of Sari, um, a young girl who is uh, basically just trying to find her way in the world. She's trying to get away from something terrible that happened to her. And she ends up in the company of an esteemed hero, a shy. Um, but she also ends up meeting somebody called Sana, who she falls in love with, but in order for them to be together, she has to stop her peoples from going to war and she has to stop Eshai from going on the war path. So it's, it's basically Sari trying to manage all of these things and um, failing horribly for a little while before <laughs> figuring it out. <laughs> I mean, don't we all? Um, <laughs> I feel like that's pretty true to life. Um, what I loved so much about Dauntless is that I felt like it was in conversation with my new book that's coming out. It's called The Sunbearer Trials, um, where we are honoring kind of where we come from, me being Mexican mm -hmm. mythos and folk folklore as being Filipino, um, without like trying to force ourselves into like completely retelling all of the stories. And like, I think it's really fun and freeing to be able to kind of take what we like about our cultures and to explode and expand it into a totally unique second world fantasy. And that was something that I really loved um, so deeply about reading Dauntless. And it was really fun um, to like get those kind of peaks and those celebrations um, was really one of my favorite things about Dauntless. Um, and kind of going off of that, what was the original inspiration for Dauntless? Was there any like folklore that you had in mind? Was there any like media that kind of helped spark this story for you? What was, where did it come from? Um, so actually I came up with the world 
a long time before I came up with this story. <laughs> so Ashai was actually the first character I ever came up with. Oh. Um, I just really wanted to write this story about exploration because at the time I was an oceanography PhD in Seattle and I was um, actually wrapping up my thesis. Uh, and you know, uh, if anybody's ever done a PhD thesis, by the time you get to the end, you hate everything about the project <laughs> and everything about your life choices. So I was sitting there struggling to get through um, what's essentially like endless revisions and crunching and recrunching numbers. And I was like, why did I study oceanography in the first place? Um, <laughs> and I remembered that I got into this because I was curious. So I grew up by the ocean. I grew up looking at the ocean and thinking, you know, mm -hmm. what's out there? And I wanted to write a story with characters who, who hadn't yet fully explored their world. So mm. the world was just a big mystery. Like they would spend all their time looking out. Certain people would spend their time looking out and wondering, you know, what's out in that world. And I wanted to write about those people and the act of, of going out there and looking into the unknown, um, not as something to be feared, but as something to be curious about. Uh, and so the first story I wrote in this world was a shy story. And I, I wrote the story of the valiants and this, this young girl who grows into a hero and kills a dragon and does all of the cool fantasy hero stuff. Uh, and then I said, this is really cool. I want to do a full novel on this. Yeah. But by then I was like, a shy is too big to be the main character. <laughs> so... <laughs> I made the main character, I, I needed the main character to be someone who was still very uncertain about the world and her place in it. And it just kind of evolved from there because from Sari's point of view, I started asking questions like, what if Ashai is not right 100% correct? And yeah. uh, what happens when these people meet somebody else? Because if they keep moving, eventually they're going to meet someone that they've never encountered before. So yeah, yeah. that's so cool. I had no idea that Ashai was the first character. Um, Speaking of characters, could you introduce us to like the three main cast and um, mm -hmm. can you also specifically tell us about the Valiants? Because those were, I mean, my favorite part of the book personally. <laughs> sure. So Dauntless has three point of view characters, two of which are on the cover of the book. Um, I think we couldn't fit Ishai in here, but <laughs> <laughs> I think she would have just kind of like exploded the cover. I think but, she would have taken over. Yeah, she's a very yeah. powerful force. <laughs> so the main character is Sari. Um, Sari is 16 years old at the start of the story. She basically is very new to the world of the Valiant. So she's she's from the people, which is the same group of people that Ashai is from. And they call themselves the people because up until this point, they believe they're the only ones in the world. Um, <laughs> She's 16, she's a little uncertain. She starts off the book, not sure where her life is going, which is very relatable. Um, so relatable, especially as a 16 yeah. year old, yes. <laughs> she gets roped into being a shy's personal assistant. Um, and through that ends up forming her own opinions about the Valiants and what they do, uh, and ends up kind of writing her own story. Sana, um, Sari's love interest, 17 at the start of the book. I don't want to talk too much about her because everything about her is like a spoiler, but <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, she's a bit more closed off than Sari. So she has a, a difficult past and she, um, she doesn't really trust easily, but she opens up to Sari midway through the book and their relationship becomes one of the driving forces of the story. And then not pictured is a shy, although I did discover that her spear is on the inside. You know, I noticed name. that earlier too when I was looking. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. and I love it. <laughs> so a shy is a shy unbroken. Um, she gets this second name because she's made her own myth uh, by killing a dragon. She's the youngest valor commander ever. She's... Um, she has this distinctive white armor. She has these stories about her. She's basically a little celebrity in their world. And she's uh, basically when coming up with a shy, I really wanted to write that big force of good that comes in and swoops in and saves the day and trains the hero and all of those things. 
Um, so yeah, as shy as that. And her could point you of view. yeah could you tell us about the armor because that was one of, that might be my favorite world building aspect in all of Dauntless. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I already forgot that you asked me to tell you about the val the valiants. No, you're doing so. Great. Yeah, <laughs> I the asked you armor. A lot of questions. <laughs> Uh, the magic system in the book is the armor. So the way it works is there's these magical beasts that roam the land of the people and they're very dangerous. Um, and the valiants are called in to deal with these beasts. But when you kill a beast, you can use its hide to make armor. Um, and while that armor at first just appears to be ordinary leather armor, when you wear it, it shapes to it, it changes its shape and its color to reflect the innermost thoughts and, and feelings of the wearer it also has uh, magic powers so basically if you get depending on the piece that you get you get different types of superhuman abilities so if you get this part the chest piece um you are basically magically protected all over your body no matter what uh, no matter what shape the armor eventually takes. When you get the gloves, you get super strength. When you get the boots, you get super speed and the ability to, as uh, some people have asked you about, anime run and jump and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> defy gravity. When you get the helmet, which Sari doesn't have, so it's not pictured, and also you wouldn't be able to see your face if it was, uh, <laughs> you get super hearing and sight and other senses. And when you get the spear, you basically just become a killing machine. <laughs> so to become a valiant, you have to kill five beasts and get the five pieces yourself. So there's no like training program where you're given <laughs> the armor. Um, and people who have only bits and pieces of it are, are aspirants. They're is on their way to becoming a valiant, but they're not there yet. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's the coolest. I read that and I was just like, this is so awesome. And I was I think from there, the story just took off for me and I was so invested. Um, so we're talking about the, the main characters and, or even side characters, honestly, for this question, but which character was the easiest for you to write and which was the hardest for you to write? Because you have three POVs in this book and I am always so intimidated by that because it's like, how the heck do I have like these three distinct voices? So I'm curious about like how that went for you and like who was easy and who was like difficult. <laughs> so on the easy side of things, um, I'm trying to decide if Sari or if Shai were easier. I think both of mm. them were, weren't that difficult to write. Um, Sari because uh, I, I could use either of them to show different parts of the world. So Sari, I could use to to show things from a newcomer's perspective, like somebody who had no idea what was going on. And as shy I could use whenever I needed somebody to be really competent and take charge. As <laughs> um, shy I had written before, so her scenes were really easy to write. Yeah. And I just, Sari was easy because I, I relate very much to feeling out of place and following along with what other people around me say is best until I figure out what I'm supposed to do. So that, that was fun. Sana was really hard because um, was she? Yeah. Uh, so actually, a lot of the scenes, uh, a lot of her scenes in the book came up in revision because I just kept oh. trying to tweak Sana and like trying to figure her out. And I don't think I nailed it until oh god, maybe the last edit session because oh. I she she's really closed off. Um, yeah, but I wanted to make her like a sympathetic love interest, especially since she does some stuff in this book that I, yeah. I knew that if I didn't make her sympathetic, some people would be really upset about. Um, yeah. And it, it's hard because she she basically wants to be the brooding love interest that swoops in and doesn't talk much. And it's really hard to write a sympathetic love interest doesn't talk much um, from the point of view of somebody else. So I had to include some scenes from her point of view just to help there. But like, yeah, she, I think some characters come easy and some characters, they just don't reveal themselves to you for a really long time. So you're like sitting there poking them with a stick. Like, who are you? Do something. I agree. <laughs> and like, for me with my writing, it's usually my main character, which is a bad 
character to like be having problems like connecting with. Um, so I'm super impressed. And it totally makes sense that Shai was like a character that you'd already like written before because you, you know, originally she was kind of your main focus. And I think that that comes through really well because I think she's really wonderfully done. Um, and yeah, so I think that makes a lot of sense for me after reading and knowing the characters now. Um, so which of the characters, was there one that you like really related to the most? Um, I think like at the time, especially because I was trying to finish my PhD and trying to prove to people that I knew what I was talking about. I, I related very much to Sari in wanting to be a shy. Like it was like, I yeah. want to show people this confidence and I want to just come in and knock it out of the park, but really I'm terrified and, uh, kind of clumsy and there's just kind of working my way through things and I'm really not sure where my life is going and all those things. Um, a lot of those anxieties of the time um, are in Sari. So she's basically a little time capsule of how it feels like to be going through a PhD and still applying for jobs and not knowing where you're gonna end up. I couldn't have <laughs> predicted Germany. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think, I think that makes complete and total sense. Um, one of my favorite things to do when I'm writing a book is to drop in like small details or like Easter eggs. So like references that people who like are in the know will be able to pick up on. I did that a lot in Cemetery Boys when it came to like the Latinx culture and kind of rituals and stuff that we do. Uh, do you have any like hidden small details that you have in Dauntless? Um, yes. So I think there's a lot of Filipino culture Easter eggs for people who are um, Filipino and who might be reading this and who who pick them out. So yeah. um, I think if I was writing this again, I might have done things differently. But when I was writing Dauntless, I never called anything by its name. I just kind of described what it was. So Sari, especially in the market scene, she like eats banana queue and watches people dance to McLing and like takes Sana out for dinner and they eat adobo. It's it's a lot of like Filipino culture Easter eggs. Yeah. There's also a tiny um, small anime Easter egg that I've never told anybody about. But I'm gonna Wait, tell me. It. So <laughs> in the opening of the book, the captain who I had to cut uh, is referred to as Turi, Captain Turi. Uh-huh. Um, so this is really, really, really weepy. And Ada, you're going to get this as soon as I tell you. I'm excited. Um, he, in Eshai's story, he had a partner who died whose name was Viku, because it's Victuri, and it's Yuri. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, Elisa. I have never been more excited about anything in my life. That is incredible, and I love it. Um, oh my god. That makes me endlessly happy. Um, oh my God, I'm so, now I'm going to obsess over that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's why everyone's like, don't ask him about what happened back then. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm obsessed. Okay, I'm so distracted by that. <laughs> I'm really yeah. excited. I love that. And I think it's really funny because um, you're Filipino, I'm Mexican, and we have we were colonized by the same people. So it's funny, um, like adobo and stuff like that. There's a lot of the food references that were in Dauntless. I was like, oh yeah, I have a yeah. variation of that too. And that was like- Yeah, although it's a different adobo, right? Like, yeah, uh, yes. So that's that's something that I had to learn like the hard way when I moved yeah. over there. It's like, I know what this is. I do not know what this is. You're like, wait. Yeah. <laughs> Teach me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, speaking of fun Easter eggs and stuff like that, without spoilers, which was your favorite scene to write and which was your least favorite scene to write? Okay, favorite scene. There's a bunch. I think one of the ones that always stands out to me is the one that actually ended up on the jacket copy, which is where Sari is running away from some beasts and she uh, ends up hiding in this tower that is there's basically no escape and she decides to do something pretty cool. Um, and that scene, and I can just say it here. So spoiler alert, cover your ears. <laughs> she blows the whole tower up. 
um, basically like sets it on fire and yeah. jumps out the window. And yeah. <laughs> I, I loved writing that scene because at the time, I didn't actually know how she was going to get out of that. So I had written, <laughs> this was my first like foray into outlining. I'm normally a pretty comfortable <laughs> pantser. And so in the uh -huh. outline, I had just written like, she gets out of this somehow, <laughs> which is very frustrating because you're sitting there and like, okay, pass me, but like, <laughs> how? Uh, so I had to write her out and that was fun for me to write because I would look, I was like, the desperation where Sari's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. was partly mine. Like, I don't know how to get you out of this kiddo. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, Better blow then, something up. <laughs> yeah, she looked around and I was like, what, what does she have? What does she have? And, and that came up and I was like, okay, this is going to be a very cool scene. So, yeah. Yeah. And which one was the hardest to write? Uh, I couldn't figure out where to start the story. Oh um, God, isn't that the yeah. worst? Yeah. So, so there's hard. actually like several starting scenes that no one ever sees. So initially I started it a little further back with them like traveling to the settlement. And, and then mm. I was like, I don't like it. Moved it forward, moved it forward. And finally I was like, this is, this is why we lost the captain. Cause I was like, ah, <laughs> frick, let's just start this when they get there and yeah. let people figure out what on earth happened. Yeah. yeah, I I I had the same problem with Lost in the Neverwoods. I rewrote that opening scene like until the very last draft that we were like revising. Um, so I that's incredibly relatable. It's so hard to tell where to start it, especially when you're first writing a book. I feel like you have to really finish writing the whole thing before you can go back and be like, oh, it should actually start at this. And that's the spot. thing, because right? like I when you start a book, I don't know about you, but when I start a book, I have no idea what I'm doing like yeah I'm just like, oh, I, I have kind of a vibe but I don't know what the story is about I don't know who any of these people are I yeah. don't know like where this is gonna go um yeah yeah I see I'm a plotter and even with my really intense outlines I don't I feel like I don't know what's going on or where I'm going the whole time either so mm -hmm. not just the beginning um so I think that makes a lot of sense uh so when it comes to the process of writing do you have any like rituals that you do? Do you have playlists? Do you like, I know a lot of authors go on Pinterest and make like mood boards in order to like get themselves in the zone. Uh, what, what, what helps you write the best? So um, I have a huge playlist that's basically like soundtracks. Um, Amazing. From video games and, and mostly video games and some movies that I liked. Um, as someone told me once to use video game soundtracks because they are made to not interrupt your your thinking uh, yeah. to just be in the background while you're doing stuff and I kind of just took that to heart and made this enormous playlist and back in the pantsing days I would shuffle the playlist and listen to it um, while I was was writing and when the playlist would dramatically like give me a completely different vibe I'd be like yeah. okay time for something interesting to happen in the story <laughs> um <laughs> So I, uh, nowadays I can't do that so much because I have to plan everything out in advance. Um, but I still kind of, I do this thing where I'll shuffle my, my actual playlist of, of all the songs that I like and I'll just walk around and be like, oh, random song just came on. Which character can I relate this song to? <laughs> and that kind of, that exercise has always helped me figure out strange things about characters. Um, like flesh them out a little bit more. Uh, these days, because I'm also working in a lab, um, unfortunately, I can't write full time right yeah. now. Uh, writing is mostly whenever I can spare really quickly, like on a lunch break, on, on whatever, like let me just hammer out a few scenes. Yeah. Um, so I feel like my process is actually, which is almost a little bit sad, gotten streamlined to the point where it's not it doesn't have a whole lot of ritual. It's just like, okay, time to write. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I still yeah. like to use the songs for plotting and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, I love how you kind of use songs as they come to you and you're like, all right, well now we're going to do something with this. I think that's a really, that would be even just like a really fun writing exercise for like people who are trying to like figure out a story or even just like get into writing, picking yeah. like random songs and being like, okay, this is what we're going with. I love still that. what I'll do, like 
um, back when I'm coming up with an outline, like if there's, let's say 50 chapters, I'll come up with a randomized playlist of 50 songs and be like, fun challenge. Let's try and make each song relate to each chapter uh, yeah. in some way. So just to, to throw a little random element in there, because otherwise I think I, for me personally, I have a hard time coming up with what to do next. Like I yeah. need to be constrained by structure. So when yes, I'm outlining a novel, I'll always start with the structure. Like, yeah, this will have this many chapters and the chapters will be this length and they'll alternate POVs in this recognizable pattern. Uh, yeah, I love that. Have I have I told them myself enough? Can everyone tell them neurodivergent? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say my brain does that also. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I need the structure. Otherwise, like, God only knows where I would get lost in the woods somewhere. And I think, yeah, lost in the neverwoods. <laughs> yeah, lost in the neverwoods, some might say. <laughs> I think good. fantasy especially, um, because otherwise you have too many choices. You can literally do anything. Like literally in a world anything. where anything can happen, you need you need to make some like guideposts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really rough. I, I, yeah, that's a really good idea. I might even try doing that. And I totally understand the like, necessity of like not having ritual because I would also when especially when I was writing uh cemetery boys I would do it like between work meetings definitely on my lunch break and then like at night when I got home and then like on the weekend and stuff like that so yeah I got accustomed to kind of writing anywhere which is why I like using google docs so much because I can do it on my phone my desktop or on my laptop so it's like literally wherever I am and whenever I have some time just jump in and start um making some words happen so I think yeah I totally understand that yeah. forged um, in the fires of NaNoWriMo where you just uh, literally like whatever yeah. the heck you can <laughs> totally that's exactly it I'm really glad that our brains are like yeah very similar I was the kid on happy. family road trips where people would be like stop typing in the back seat how can you even see and I <laughs> yeah how are you not getting car sick it's like don't worry about it like it's because I need yeah. to write <laughs> so <laughs> um, so the next thing that I would love to talk about is you have a beautiful cover mm -hmm. um, and especially the back cover I, I'm so glad you, that you brought that up because I read Dauntless before it had a cover and I remember um, when I finally saw the full spread I was like that is exactly how I pictured it in my head so that was really exciting for me personally um, can you tell us what about the cover process, what that was like for you, and like what the steps were involved. Um, so the first thing that I was asked uh, when I signed for Dauntless was like, here, can you make this whole document and can you maybe put in some thoughts about a cover? But I am really not a visual person at all. Oh. Like I have a hard time imagining people's faces like I have a hard time imagining what people yeah. actually look like unless it's like super important to the story that they have certain features um so I threw together a big mess that was, was like something like this and something like this and I don't know like give a shy shampoo model hair for the heck of it and let's, yeah. <laughs> let's do these things um but I did say I think it'd be really cool to have an illustrated cover yeah um and nothing else in that document happened except for the illustrated <laughs> cover because I, I don't know why I was sitting there it's like it has to be green, this green. Uh, it's better no, this I way. love yeah it's so gorgeous isn't it especially but, the colors are beautiful yeah they sent me I, I said two things it has to be illustrated and if you're going to illustrate it you need a Filipino artist to do it yes um, and so they said that sounds great um and they put out actually an open call on Twitter for Filipino artists so when I saw oh, that happening so cool. it was like Ah, that's awesome. And they sent me a package with four artists on it. And they said, you know, which one speaks to you? And I yeah. kept looking back at it. Um, and Sarah Gonzalez was one of the, the artists. And they were all amazing. And there were some that had a more like comic book style that I thought would be really cool. But the more I kept looking at it, the more I was like, I don't know, there's something about this that that I really like the vibes of this artist. Yeah. Um, so I eventually wrote back and I was like, can you get Sarah Gonzalez because I think her art is really cool yeah. and they got her so 99% of this was Sarah um well no 80% of this was Sarah 20% um was Yella on Twitter a, a character artist who 
I needed to see the characters come out and I asked her to commission some work. And then I showed those commission pieces to Sarah and I was like, this is the art I already had. And I didn't expect her to use it wholesale. I was like, they look sort of kind of like this, but if you... (laughs) um, But what's really cool is that Sarah just took that and ran with it and incorporated the, those entire designs into yeah. the characters. Um, yeah. but this is all her. And I think what, what I really loved is that she read the book. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So Yeah, and I, I love it. I also love that other art that you commissioned. And I've always thought that they looked really similar. And I was like, they really picked up on Elisa's descriptions, but it's not, but that was nice. It's really cool that you were just like, hey, here's this character art if you want to do um, something yeah. similar to it. Yeah, I love that. That's really cool. Cause it's a, it's, a stunning cover. It's yeah. one of my favorites, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, and I've loved working with Sarah. So she designed the cover for my second book too. And yes, like, which is also beautiful. So good, yeah. <laughs> So this um, is basically exactly how I pictured it, but I didn't know they were going to do this either. So yeah, yeah, I, I know it was so yeah, it was so so cool. Mm-hmm. I was really excited about seeing that. So I keep like turning your book over and staring at it. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, are there any scenes that you had to cut, or were there scenes you like wanted to add but like didn't have space for, or anything like that that happened while you were writing Dauntless? Um, so there were a few scenes, like I said, from the beginning that I cut out before I even sent it to Rachel, but it was <laughs> like Sari traveling in the woods. Uh, I thought that those would be fun because those were like her first traveling scenes, but it turns out that yeah. I didn't actually need them in the book. But otherwise, I think Dauntless, um, I don't think there's too many, at least if I had to cut them, I don't mourn them because That's the, <laughs> the finished product was really good and everything important that I wanted to add uh, is there. So I think like, I, I didn't have too many darlings that needed yeah. sad killing. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's nice. I, I, I'm similar in that like usually my, I don't know how your process is, but usually my first draft is the shortest, shortest draft. So as I'm going, I'm actually adding more rather than taking away. I don't, I don't know if, I don't think I'd be very good at being like cutting stuff. I get too attached. <laughs> I, I write long actually. So oh, do the you? drafts do we are have a the bit long. Yeah, oh, yeah but I think like by the time it gets through, um, like I look, I usually try to look at it twice. At least that's what I'm doing now with, with drafting, but for Dauntless yeah. and, and Stolen City, because I didn't have an editor at the time I had, I looked at each one three times. And so before Rachel saw it, I, I revised this three times. And then oh. um, she saw it and then she sent me back this thing. And by the time I got the edit letter, I was like, I, yeah, I don't care anymore. Just, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think like um, being, uh, so go- going through like my PhD program and having like my very first scientific paper be absolutely nothing like the very first draft of it because my advisor kept like making me rewrite things and cutting things out. <laughs> um, by the time I got to editing an actual book, I was like, yeah, sure, take it out. I'm out here. Like, you're like, you're like, I've been this through this before. I I have no darlings. I appreciate it. that's very powerful of you, in fact, I would say. <laughs> um, I, I am attached, like first draft, but after you read it a few times, I'm like, oh my God. I mean, thank God somebody else is looking at this and telling me you should maybe not have this scene or move this scene or (laughs) or something. Um, The, but Dauntless, I was surprised. It didn't get, it didn't get too terribly edited. So the version that you're seeing is a cleaner, nicer with some scenes added version of of what I sent. What got, and we can talk about this like in a month um, for Stolen City's launch event, but that book got blasted to pieces and put that oh, well, yeah. um, <laughs> well, like I just cried for days yeah that's rough well uh, I had to rewrite the first third which basically oh. essentially so I'm sitting there and I'm like I knew it uh I think like that's the thing that you don't know about like that that maybe some people don't expect about editing was when Rachel got back to me and said like act what is not working I was like I know like, um, yeah. I knew that <laughs> but <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it she was like, I think you just have to rewrite this. I was like, yeah, well, I was afraid you'd say that. <laughs> um, but 
Yeah, I drafting is my least favorite part of the entire process. Um, yeah. And it's usually because I just like hit dead ends. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. So it's a relief to revise and have someone to tell me like what to fix and like how to fix it. Because there's definitely, I'm drafting um, currently and it's a, a sequel. And um, at some point when I just get like too stuck, I'm like, I, you know what? This is Holly's problem, Holly, who is my editor. And it's not my problem right now, it's Holly's problem. So I'm gonna um, let her deal with that. And I'm just gonna keep moving forward because at some point you kind of just have to. Um, so I, that, yeah. Yeah, I think having someone else um, and being accountable to someone else really helps yes. because like, I was sat there in dread. I was like, I think I have to rewrite it. But I think until some, if nobody had told me you have to fix it, I would have been like, that's too much work. Yeah. Like I never would have sat there and been like, okay, let's just delete a third yeah. of this novel. Yeah. And it's also yeah. funny because it's like before I really started writing, you would see people on Twitter being like, uh, you know, you have to really like the book that you're writing because you're gonna have to read it a billion times. And I was like, I'll never get sick of writing of reading my own stories. Like I love my stories. Um, and then very quickly discovered that no, if I never read the first. I think third of both of my books ever again, I I, I would die happy. Cause it's like, Dude. those are usually, it's that first act that is so hard yeah. to get right. Have and people have actually like, when you, when you, when people pull passages from your book and you're like, that's really good. Who wrote that? Yeah, you know, like, did I write that? Cause <laughs> that <laughs> I'm not reading this again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's actually a really funny instance of that happening where um, I have a merch store where I like donate money to charity. And I um, asked uh, an artist to like make some t-shirt designs. And she sent me a t-shirt design that had a grave, a grave on it and then like a quote on it. And I was like, hey, I really like this design, but could you put a line like that I wrote onto the headstone? And she had to email me back and I was like, Aiden, you wrote that. And this is the page that it's on. And I was like, <laughs> oh no, I was like, that was so embarrassing. I was like, I do not remember writing that at all. <laughs> so yeah, that's embarrassing. And just as a reminder, if you have any questions, drop them down into the Q&A because we're gonna start those in just a handful of minutes. I only have a couple mm -hmm. more questions left. Um, so my next question is, what do you hope that readers take away from Dauntless? Like when they're done finishing it, what is something that you hope they think or feel? I, I really like hope, I think it's in the title, right? Like I just really wanted to empower people to go do the scary thing. Um, the, whatever the scary thing is in their life. Like in my life, it was getting a PhD and writing a sapphic book, right? Like, but yeah. in other people's lives, it might be a very different thing. Um, so when I have a shy saying, you know, be dauntless, and that ended up in the front of the book, uh, that's sort of the message to everybody. Like, yeah. yeah, I guess whatever's terrifying you right now, whatever you, you know you have to do, but you don't want to do. Um, yeah. You know, like I am personally telling you, go do the thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. I, I think that's a great message. And one that is like a universal experience to everybody. Because just like you said, we're all scared of things but it's you know yeah. terrifying <laughs> um okay so what are some books that you think readers will like if they enjoy Dauntless Ooh, um so first of all I just want to give a shout out because I know you have a book coming out I think if you enjoy <laughs> Dauntless you really should pick up the Sunbearer Trials because it looks <laughs> awesome um and I don't know is your pre-order campaign still going it is, yeah. I have a yeah. pre-order campaign where um, if you submit your pre-order receipt, you can get um, five randomized trading cards from the book, and that's all free. Uh, and there are links to it in all of my bios on social media. So if anyone's there's, looking for it. Mm -hmm. There's also yeah, this I, like wave. Oh, carry on. Sorry. I totally agree with you also um, that Dauntless and uh, the Sunbearer Trials, again, with that like the folklore and like culturally inspired second world fantasy. I think that they're in conversation a lot. And, you know, you have the, um, I just forgot the, 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 the strong people, what are they called? The valiants, the valiants. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. You have the valiants and I have the golds in, um, Sunbearer trials. So it's, yeah, I, 
I agree. I was gonna. I was gonna say, if you like some bear trials, you're gonna fucking love Dauntless. So that's and really I think exciting. like there is this wave of culturally inspired secondary world fantasy that has released and is still continuing to release. So if you like Dauntless but want something a bit more adult, um, I cannot recommend the Sapphic Trifecta from last year too much. <laughs> so that's. The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri, The Unbroken by C.L. Clark, and She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan. Yes. Oh. All of those books are amazing. All of those are culturally Good. expired secondary world fantasies. Well, I think She Who Became the Sun is like alternate history, but um, yeah. uh, you, get the, you get the idea. And uh, they're very different, but I kind of love them all. So yes. you can't really go wrong. Uh, on the young adult side, even just within the debuts this year, there have been a bunch of really, really cool fantasies. So if you yeah. want, you really just pick where you want to travel in the world. You, there's a fantasy world version of it. Uh, for India, there's the Ivory Key by Akshay Rahman. That's like adventure um, and solving puzzles and four siblings. It's really cool. Um, Daughter of the Moon Goddess came out. That's oh, yeah. China. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I could just talk books all day. <laughs> so, yeah. If you want to go, if you do want to go to Europe um, and read something sapphic that's uh, still got the adventure vibes, there's the Bone Spindle, which is like a really good I sleeping love that account. book. Yeah. I love that book. That book has one of the best um, prologues I've ever read. I, yeah, I like went yeah. to the store and I flipped through it and I started reading it and I bought it immediately because it sounded incredible. Yes, I highly, highly recommend uh, Bone Spindle as well. It's a yeah. fantastic book. I, what's, I still find so amazing about this book is that I don't like Sleeping Beauty. And yeah. when someone was like, <laughs> retelling, I was like, I don't know, but I read it and I was like, this is a good retelling. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really fun. I, I totally agree. And then, so my last question is, um, what's next? What else have you been working on? Um, which book is coming out next? Which is Stolen City, if you could give us yeah. a little sneak peek at that. And then also tell us about the book that was just just announced yesterday. Was it yesterday? It feels like yesterday, but it was actually last week. Last week, okay, yes. Yeah. Uh, time has no meaning anymore. It's um, truly. <laughs> So Stolen City is coming out on September 20. It's a completely different book. It's still YA fantasy. Um, it's, it's a heist. So it's twin thieves who um, basically live on a colonized island and are stealing magical artifacts back from the empire that's taken over their island. Uh, and they end up, although they initially, especially the protagonists, don't want to be involved in the resistance, they obviously end up involved <laughs> in the resistance. Um, so yeah, it's it's just a, a fun heist. It moves pretty quickly. It has four POV characters and they four. all get in each other's way. Yeah. So if you like three, <laughs> um, there's a fourth one. And Stolen City, if you like like messy kids getting in each other's way all the time, um, then that's that's the book for you. Uh, <laughs> and then the book that was just announced is Exiles of Ellery West. Um, the title's probably gonna change, but that's, I need a title to start writing and then I always yeah. change it like at the end. Um, this one is very different from the other two. It's still YA fantasy, it's still a standalone, but it's contemporary YA fantasy. Mm. So it's oh, set yeah. in our oh. world, um, which is terrifying for me because I still believe that I don't fully understand how our world works. Like, <laughs> because I've spent so much of my formative years trying to escape it in any yeah. way, shape, or form. Um, but Exiles is a, a magic school. So it's, it features a Filipino-American girl who uh, is in her last year of magic school. But um, because of some thing that she did in the previous year uh, involving her friend and some dark magic, she has to go through this year as a member of the probationary class, which basically means oh. like one more strike and you are out. And in this school, getting expelled means having your magic taken away. Mm. Um, so you have to live as an ordinary person. So she at first is very sad about this and upset and totally in survival mode. Like She just wants to get through this, this school year. Yeah. But she ends up in... Uh, she ends up basically 
finding her family among the other exiles, the other probationary class members. And when the forest uh, that stole her best friend starts taking more students, she realizes she woke something up Ooh. that she and the other um, probationary students will have to uh, deal with without getting their magic taken away, without getting expelled. And she finds out that the school has some darker secrets than she intended. So actually, I didn't I, I keep wanting to write just a straight like fantasy school and then I'm like, but what if yeah. the school is evil actually? <laughs> or like Yeah. <laughs> what if the school is problematic actually, which I think should say what like academia has been like. But yeah. <laughs> that sounds incredible and I'm so excited. I think we're getting a little bit of a dark academia boom right now and I mm -hmm. I'm all for it. I'm very excited about it. Oh, and I forgot to say, uh, this is set in the San Juan Islands. So it's a secret. Oh! Yeah, for so all of you who are local, this is a secret magic school in the Pacific Northwest that's hidden on an island that's unplottable on any map that nobody knows about. So oh, I um, love that. I wrote this because I was an oceanography student at UW and we have Friday Harbor Labs out there, uh -huh. uh, which is in Friday Harbor. And because we were grad students, we came out every year, but they only let us use the labs in the middle of winter for a party. Oh. <laughs> um, so we would go out in January every year and spend like three days um, in Friday Harbor when it's dark and quiet and nobody's yeah. there. Uh, and I was like, I don't know why that setting just, I loved it because that's yeah. for me. I was like, this would be a great place to do some spooky dark academia. Um, <laughs> I uh, love that and I completely agree. Um, yeah. yeah, my gosh, I'm so excited now. Um, not that I wasn't before, but even more so. Um, okay, so we have a few questions to get through mm -hmm. from the audience. I like this one a lot. Um, would you ever return to the world of Dauntless for a short story or a sequel? I would love to. Um, <laughs> I I grew up on series. So I think like, uh, every every single book I write, I leave myself an opening to come back to the world. Um, I would really, really love to. So I, I don't want to tell you guys where it ends, but um, let's just say that it ends with the characters being given a direction, something they can explore further. And I did that on purpose because I was like, I thought it'd be really cool to eventually do a set of standalones where it's just the characters slowly um like moving forward in time and also exploring new biomes yeah I don't know yeah how that would work in YA though because I feel like eventually the characters would age out <laughs> um <laughs> yeah that's so, true I mean you just do upper YA yeah. it's fine um, my draft, I would personally my, love that yeah my first draft of Dauntless for those of you who don't know I thought I was writing adult fantasy, which is very <laughs> confusing to me now because now I understand a little bit more. So I was like, oh yeah, well, obviously I can have them like age up and then just keep yeah. progressing through the world. But um, I, I've been holding off on plotting it though because of I wrote myself into a certain corner. Um, the, okay. the biome that I picked that Aiden, you know, because you read the book, is something I don't have a lot of experience in and is something I'm going to have to watch a, a bunch of scary <laughs> documentaries and read a bunch of books and, and stuff before I, uh, I can write that. Yeah. I think that's a lot of the fun part, though, is uh, doing the research. I, I can't tell you how many Crash Course mythology videos I watched on YouTube in order to like learn how to create a pantheon of gods and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I think you would have a lot of fun with it. And um, yeah, I'm very similar too in that I leave, I leave the door open in case I ever want to go back there again. And lo and behold, a Cemetery Boy sequel is happening. So, I think yeah. I I would be very happy if that thing didn't happen with Dauntless. Personally. I mean, ideally, I would love to keep pushing the characters until they get to the ocean because, like, they yeah, haven't, they haven't discovered the ocean yet. Yeah, uh, so they're they're in the middle of the rainforest. This is not a spoiler. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if I'll ever be able to write the book. So maybe in this, I can say what I had an idea for, like what the world they're in actually is. Yeah. Um, it, it's a giant caldera, but they wouldn't know this until they oh. climb out of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that'd be so cool. 
and and volcanoes are so cool okay i'm very excited yeah. <laughs> this is all very exciting okay. and i hope it happens <laughs> i don't know i would love to do it someday so i don't if anyone's listening like yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so i'm popping over into the q and a again um this is a good question what were some of the biggest changes in direction between the original and the final drafts so the original draft of Dauntless was um, a mess. <laughs> I, it, it was pretty aimless. I think like when I first started writing it, I was still, you know, people good, everything else bad. And then I was like, this is not how I want to write this because <laughs> like I come, you know, I come from a background where like historically meeting other people has not been very good for my country. Um, yeah, And true. I wanted to, to show that maybe the people did something, do do things that aren't great, and and make this this relationship a bit more complex and, and give them yeah. more things to figure out. Um, so that's that's one of the biggest changes. The other change was with Sari. I originally had her be entirely uh, a person who's just part of the people, but. Oh. Okay, um, so mild spoiler territory, I guess. If you haven't read this, everybody go and mute me for like five seconds. Three, <laughs> two, one. Uh, Sari is half of half the people and half Sana's people. Um, and I did that because that sort of reflects my personal identity. I'm half Filipino, half Spanish, which if you, is, is basically an identity crisis a day. Um, yes. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I, I wanted to explore that in Sari. Um, and I think I wanted to, without even planning it this way, I just thought it would be something cool to do. I ended up working through a lot of my own feelings with like Sari working out whose side she's on and then deciding yeah. maybe I don't want to be on a side. Maybe I can be both things and maybe I can like find a way to exist as both in, in, yeah. in this world. So, yeah. I love that. That's beautiful and very mm -hmm. fitting, I think. Um, okay, next question is, so we were talking about music and how that helps you write. Um, what musical, oh, let me try that again. What musical style fits the characters? Sana, uh, probably, I'm, I'm not a music person. So if you're a music <laughs> person, I'm so sorry. Uh, this <laughs> is going to suck. And I'm saying this specifically to my sister who I know is listening. Uh, <laughs> Sana is probably, I would say something softer, maybe some like, uh, piano instrumental things that totally. uh yeah sari um honestly sari would probably bounce around she's still figuring out her own opinions still figuring out what she likes and she would definitely try a whole bunch of new things so i think depending on the scene you can change like sari's musical style for the scene yeah. um Eshai, is basically like epic music personified so like yep. if you ever wanted the 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 swelling like music <laughs> of like someone heroically rushing in leading an army yeah. that that would be a shy i love that um yes that fits perfectly and i i love once you told me that you like wrote to these big like you know um, soundtracks like fantasy adventure ones. I was like that makes total sense <laughs> for what i've read i i may have listened to the yuri and i soundtrack Yes! Especially, oh my god. Especially so right. the titular song. Um yes. which is like my favorite. And that I one... was like, I want to write a story that makes me feel how this song makes me feel. Yes. Um, yeah. That song is literally on my Cemetery Boys playlist. So yes. Yay. <laughs> um, okay, so I have one more question, and I think then we'll be right at time. Um, from Eric it says, Hey Lisa, so excited for your novel. My question. Do any of your fiction writing strategies overlap with your academic writing strategies, excluding the endless edits and re-edits? <laughs> uh, they're, they're the same picture. Um, so <laughs> I think the ideas are different, obviously. When you're writing um, an academic paper, you're focusing on accuracy. You're focusing on presenting information without bias. And when you're writing a story, you're focusing on emotional manipulation on um, changing, on, on like writing something that, that makes people feel things on flowery language and on complete, because I write fantasy, complete impossibilities, like scientific yeah. impossibilities. 
But once you come up with the idea, or at least once I come up with the idea, the actual process of sitting down every day and getting the words on paper is surprisingly similar. Um, <laughs> so I set goals for myself for both things. I set goals for myself. I say, okay, like for an academic paper, it might be today, we're going to write a third of the introduction, just do it. Um, and for a, a fiction thing, it might be today, we're going to write a thousand words. Um, and I just let myself be bad. So I let the first draft be terrible for both things. Um, and then when I'm done, I print it out. Um, I'm doing it less for my novels because that's a lot of paper. But for an academic paper, 100% print it out because things look different when they're in front of you. Um, totally. And I do that and I read through it and I say, okay, this is for an academic paper, I'm looking for different things. So for a story, I'm looking for what works and what doesn't work. For an academic paper, I'm looking for like what's true, what's defensible, what's I'm reaching, what needs a citation. <laughs> um, and I, I just edit it a few times um, with those with the overall goals in mind. But yeah, the sitting down and the butt in chair writing part is, is pretty much the same. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that makes perfect sense. And I, again, I really like how me and you are very strategic um, with our writing and drafting. Yeah. Um, and I think that is time for us. I'm gonna go ahead and let Dwayne take over again. Yeah, I didn't explain more about the book because you were in conversation. I figured I didn't need to give a synopsis of your book because he would uh, know more about it than I would. Thank you very much. <laughs> I really wanna read this San Juan's novel now. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm still writing away, it, so it'll come out, um, I think spring 2024 is our target, yeah. so uh, that's that. in a couple of years, and I I would love to make it out there when that book comes out, just so that we would I love can, to have you. Yeah. Don't say it might be out in the spring, might time this perfectly. Aiden, thank <laughs> you very much for taking the time and, and being in conversation. I want to remind folks that they can either come in and get a book or buy it from us uh, off our website. I recommend you do. It's a lot of fun. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. You all have a good night. Yeah. Thank you so yes, much, thank Elisa. You everyone, and congratulations. Thank you, Aiden, for hosting. Oh, yeah, my God. Happy to do it anytime. <laughs>